she's going to teach not only me, but all of you out there as well, about what happened with Coldwater Creek. We're going to take a little bit of a trip back in time, a little history lesson tonight. And we need to do this because it's important, and it's connected to what's going on over at Westlake right now. And anywhere else that people are affected by nuke waste and radiation. So without further ado, let me bring up my guest. He's one of the founding members of the activists that are out there putting together the information and getting it out to the public about Coldwater Creek, telling them what happened to them. I know the, the website's called Coldwater Creek Facts. My guest tonight is Kim Visentine. Kim, thank you so much and welcome to Down the Rabbit Hole for the first time, but not the last time. Hi, thank you so much for having me on today. Most of us grew up in a northern suburb in St. Louis. Us. And we lived, I think, what you would consider the quintessential middle class 1950s to 1970s childhood in, in this little town in the suburbs. Children do. We all grew up. Many of us went away to college. We all got jobs. A lot of us moved away after college. We all grew up. Um, I currently live in the Detroit area. We all reconnected on Facebook in 2011 in our 30s and 40s. And what we started noticing is that all of us were sick and we couldn't figure out why. And just not sick with colds, but sick with like crazy cancers and rare diseases and it, it was just it was really odd so as we moved away and we got back together and we started noticing these rare cancers I have to admit that of our founding group of seven people many professors teachers engineers that was kind of our background and we began to question this isn't right how can everybody in our grade school be sick how can everybody every girl in the sixth grade class be infertile it's the numbers aren't right. Something's not right. So in 2011, after, you know, reconnecting, we started a Facebook page. And at first it was just 10 of us. It was, you know, the only connection we could make is that we all grew up around this creek. We had no idea what the contamination in the area was or what was going on. It was really just an inquiry. Hey, are you sick? Did you live in this area? Did you live near the creek? The response was overwhelming. People started coming forward. It was neighbors and friends of friends and aunts and uncles and cousins. And we grew organically. Um, it became overwhelming. People were, you know, reaching out to us and, and sharing their stories of their illnesses. You know, I myself lost my child to a glioblastoma multiform, which is a grade 4 brain tumor that he was born with. Typically, this brain tumor is seen in 60-year-old men, not babies. It's almost a death sentence. He was given three months to live upon diagnosis. He was two days old. He ended up living six years. You know, we're thankful for every moment that we had with him, but we were told we were one in a million by the doctors. Um, other people in our group have experienced other rare cancers. They were told they were one in a million, and we were just dispersed all across the country, so we had no connection. We had no idea. The first 750 responses from people are, are handwritten in a notebook of personal stories of tragedy. Um, we then decided as we grew... And our page grew. We created a health survey online and had people start filling that out. Our page is now over 11,000 people. We're approaching 12,000 of people that grew up in the area. And it's all grown up organically and by word of mouth. But as, you know, in 2011, we started looking into what, what could possibly have caused this. How could we all be so sick? Um, we began just researching documents and news stories, and one of the girls on our page found an article talking about the Army Corps of Engineers doing cleanup in the area, unbeknownst to us. They started in 1989. They're there, and they're, I, I would say... They're not hidden, but hidden in plain sight, right? There's a trailer out there. There's a work crew. Nobody pays any attention. It's just a construction crew in a, you know, middle-class neighborhood. You know, for all we knew, they could be building a shopping center. As we looked into the documents, we began to uncover and realize that one of the major chemical companies in the area, which is Malincrot, um, many people might know them today as Covidian, 
Um, they're a major pharmaceutical company. Um, anybody who's in the medical field would also realize they do supplies to hospitals as well. But back in the late 1930s, early 1940s, Mallinckrodt himself was approached by several colleagues from, that he was friends with from college, um, and those colleagues included Arthur Compton and Albert Einstein. And they approached his company, which was an x-ray company, and asked him to process all of the uranium for the man. Manhattan Project. It's my understanding, and from the news stories, he turned them down several times, and uh, they were persistent because they knew he had a process in place that could, you know, he was already working with radioactive materials that he could help them refine this uranium. Mallinckrodt ultimately agreed to support them. It was wartime, you know, a wartime effort. You know, it was it was a very patriotic thing, but he had one request, and his request was that if he got involved, did his civic duty, or became a contractor to the government, that he would never be held liable for any of the products that he produced. So years went on. Starting in 1942, they began processing all the uranium for the Manhattan Project. All of the uranium that went into the first chain reaction at the University of Chicago was processed in St. Louis and shipped to Chicago, University of Chicago. So we truly are the birthplace of the Manhattan Project in St. Louis from a materials perspective. Um, many people are not aware of it because, again, it was wartime and, you know, this isn't something folks were advertising. They became so good at processing the material and so prolific that they ran out of room at Mallinckrodt Chemical Works, which was in downtown St. Louis, and they began storing the materials off-site in a unpopulated area north of the city. They ended up storing thousands, hundreds of thousands of barrels, industrial barrels of residual uranium byproducts from the processing, and they stored it at the basin of this creek in North County, North St. Louis County. This creek happens to run 19 linear miles into the confluence of the Missouri River, which dumps into the Mississippi right upstream from Anheuser-Busch um, and where the water intake is for Anheuser-Busch. But it runs 19 linear miles, and it is a 42-square-mile watershed. You know, people are like, that's such a huge watershed, but what folks don't understand is Missouri is kind of known for their caves. I mean, anybody who's read Mark Twain knows that Injun Joe hid in a cave, that Anheuser-Busch actually established themselves in St. Louis because they, before re refrigeration, they could store all the beer in the caverns in the city. So the entire area is interconnected underground by rivers and waterways and these caverns. And so by storing this material next to the headwaters of a creek, as it eroded into the creek, it was basically free to move about the cabin, right, in this 42 square miles. You know, years this, was, this material sat next to the mouth of this creek in these barrels. First they started with barrels and then... They were producing so much that they stopped putting it in barrels and they were dumping it in dump trucks into the open air next to ball fields in the, you know, across the street in northern St. Louis. And that started in 1946. The mid-50s, there was a huge population boom and, you know, what typically happens is as your population expands, they kind of all move out to the suburbs. Everybody wants to buy a new house. This was the 50s. McDonnell Douglas was just coming into their own building F-18s. So the area was very, um, it was growing, an upper middle class neighborhood, and there was a lot of industry. And so they took this creek in these undeveloped area, and they rerouted the creek to make it more aesthetic and built all these brand new subdivisions, golf courses, shopping malls. And when they did it, you know, who doesn't want a little brook or a creek meandering through their subdivision for their children to play in? As they rerouted this creek that had unknowingly become contaminated with the uranium, they took that sediment that was in the creek and they effectively spread it as fill dirt across all of these subdivisions, much like spreading icing on a cake. And then as children, we grew up in these new homes, unknowingly playing in the yards, vegetable gardens were being grown um, there were a lot of da dairy farms in the area. I can recall as a child going down to the local dairy that had fresh milk and fresh ice cream from farm down the street that was being watered from the creek. 
what we know today and what we maybe didn't know in the 1950s is that chronic ingestion of this material either directly or indirectly from eating vegetation grown in it or eating um, meats and dairy products that have fed and livestock that have fed off this contaminated soil and grass will build up in your system over time. And so what we found was, you know, we were ingesting a little over time as children and that builds up in your system and then 20 years later we're all showing up with these erroneous cancers. Um, It's much like lead poisoning or arsenic poisoning where, you know, you can ingest a little bit and it not, no, there's no taste, there's no smell, there's no odor. You, the products that they have out there are not gamma emitters. So even if you run a radiation detector over the area, you will, you'll not track anything. They're alpha and beta particles, which means, you know, externally touching, you're not really at risk, but if you ingest it or inhale it, you run a great risk of of showing up with these cancers. So as we found this out and we started to realize all these cancers and people were coming forward, our defense mapping specialist from Stanford, you know, who also happens to be a child of the creek, started creating these cancer maps. And if anybody goes to our website, um, Coldwater Creek Facts, they can see these cancer maps that we've been tracking. Um, And what we started doing was bumping up the cancers we have today with the Department of um, the Veterans Affairs and with um, radiation exposure victims. And we're showing up with the exact same cancers that they're showing up with. We began connecting the dots. Um, And over time, we've gone out of our way and we have contacted the Army Corps of Engineers and the CDC and the EPA, and we have been trying to work with them. Um, They are currently cleaning up the area. They've been cleaning up the area for over 30 years now, and they expect to be there well past 2020. So there is an ongoing process to clean it up, but, you know, the damage is done for most of us. We were exposed as children in the 60s and 70s, and, you know, we can't reverse time. We can't go back and change that. So all we can do is, I mean, I hate to say it, sit around and wait and watch our loved ones show up with these cancers. So that's kind of where we're at today. You know, we're living with these cancers today. Um, We're, as a group, like I mentioned, we're over 11,000 members now. And our, our goal is working with the Army Corps of Engineers. They've really only, they've only, there was so much contamination that they have only managed to clean up the headwaters where the the waste sat. They are just now, within the past two years, moving upstream of the creek and testing for contamination. And they're finding it not just in the creek, but they're finding it in the neighborhoods because this creek floods like crazy. Um, So they're confirming everything that we have been saying, that this contamination has spread throughout the region. So we're working very diligently with the federal agencies so that we can have continued funds for cleanup for the region so that it continues to get cleaned up because there are still communities there. There are still people living there. Um, they're not at risk today, but their exposure today could cause harm to them again in 20 years. So who knows, the little girl living in my childhood home could could be looking at the same fate in her children or in herself when she grows up. So it's very important that we push for continued remediation. Um, The other thing that we're doing is many people are unaware. You know, we were unaware. We grew up there. And many of the health officials in the area are completely unaware because, you know, Doc, you know, you might go to school in Michigan and end up doing your practice in St. Louis. So they have no idea of the history there. And so our goal is to educate them so that they can understand that we're an at-risk population and, you know, hopefully help us identify these cancers and these illnesses sooner because early intervention is really, you know, it can mean the difference between life and a terminal diagnosis, you know, and it's, it's I mean, that's kind of where we're at today. So I think that's kind of a summary of where we're at. <laughs> I have a bunch of questions that I want to ask you. First thing, let's get into these maps, it's actually more, more so of a point than a question. You wanted to bring this up. Some of the maps that you've seen shared on Facebook, the pictures of the Coldwater Creek uh, like cancer cluster maps, 
and illness maps there. Some people are mistaking that, that that's actually currently Westlake and it's not currently Westlake. It's Coldwater Creek. And like we were saying, it's a good example of what Westlake is going to look like in the future. If people stay in that area and they're, they're consistently being irradiated by all this contaminated soil and anything else that's around them. Uh, but, uh, I'll give the floor to you. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. It, you know, it's a very good point. Um, many people ask us and, and we just kind of want to clarify what the maps are and what they stand for. Um, there's a couple things. So what we found is when we started approaching health officials, they told us that there was no cancer cluster. Um, that they had looked at their data and that everything was fine. And we were like, no, it's not fine. Something's, something's seriously wrong because everybody on my street that I grew up with has some type of cancer, and that's not normal, right? And they're like, nope, we looked at the data, we ran our analysis, everything's fine. Well, as we started to educate ourselves on this, we found a couple of things. I talked to before about chronic low-level exposure to ionizing radiation has a latent presentation, that's a whole lot of big words for saying, you know, if you're exposed as a kid, you're not going to show up with cancer right away. It happens over time because it mutates your DNA. So you're exposed as a child or you're exposed as a female because radiation is discriminatory. While it does affect men, it does affect women more and children, right, because it's a size thing. We were exposed. We showed up later with cancers. Well, many of us have moved away. Cancer registries, if you look at them today, they're run by state, they're not run nationally, and they only pick where you live at time of diagnosis. So, for example, I grew up my entire life, lived 27 years in the Coldwater Creek area. I moved away, I got a job, um, I was an engineer before I became a nurse, I worked for Chrysler and they moved me to Detroit. My son's diagnosis would not show up because he was not diagnosed in the, my hometown. He was not born there. So when researchers look at this, they would never pick up his cancer. Um, the other thing that researchers look at is they look at um, death certificates. And death certificates only tell, at least in the state of Missouri, what your primary cause of death was. So my son had cancer, um, but he ultimately died from respiratory failure. His heart and lungs gave out because it was a brain tumor. On his death certificate, it says Zachary Vizantine passed away from respiratory failure, nothing with his cancer. So if I'm a researcher and I look at this, he would never show up from the disease registry and he would never show up from his death certificate. And we were finding that over and over again, you know, like it's that 40-year-old not living in their parents' basement scenario, right? We all moved away. We moved away from our parents' homes. We live in a transient society today. People don't live in the same hometown they grew up in. You know, they move away. A lot of people, even if you just moved to another city in the same state, you still wouldn't be picked up. So what our cancer maps, what we created this health survey and these cancer maps to show was, did you ever live around Coldwater Creek? And if you ever lived around there and have a cancer, please report. You know, please share with us. And that's what these dots on the map are. And they're overwhelming. We're looking at over 3,500 cancers. Um, we have a really rare cancer, which is appendix cancer. We have 45 of them. And the chances of getting appendix cancer are 1 in 100,000. But many of these people moved away. And so the maps show disease around the creek. There's also a study out there, a zip code study, that shows eight, eight areas that have cancers, and it's put out by the Department of Health. They went back based on our maps and re-looked at their study, and they opened up the time frame so that they could capture some of those people that moved away. Um, and they showed high rates of cancers. But again, those cancers in those eight zip codes are based solely on Coldwater Creek and the Coldwater Creek watershed. Many people are new to the Westlake area and they don't understand that and they hear cancer cluster and they think that it's related to Westlake. And it is, but not in the way they think. Um, what we are is a beacon or a warning for what Westlake can become because we have the exact same cancer. We have the exact same waste. But our disease maps and our cancer cluster does not show contamination around Westlake. The, that report that shows those eight zip codes, all eight zip codes fall within the watershed of Coldwater Creek. And so that's the confusion. We are Westlake's future. We are not their current state. And, and you know, I just folks need to understand that. And uh, this sounds horrific, but it could be a very positive thing for Westlake because they're not experiencing the, the 
vast cancers that Coldwater Creek is yet, and so they still have time to make a difference. We are, like I said, we're a beacon. We're a warning sign. We are Christmas future for them if they don't change their ways. Those maps, those clusters, those disease rates are all related to the creek. Um, you know, the other thing is, is we can't deviate, and health officials agree, even some of the cancers that are showing up closer to the West Lake area, did they previously live in West Lake? You know, many of the people and in, in some of the founding members of West Lake, you know, are experiencing illnesses, but they grew up as children in Coldwater Creek as well. Now, you you were saying earlier that there are still houses along the creek? There's still the communities? Oh, absolutely. It's still communities there. That's horrific. Yeah, people still live there. How is the Army Corps of Engineers not being taken to task by anybody that's still in houses there? Did they bulldoze your old community that you grew up in and, and like, fence no, it off? Or no. is it still there? Those houses are still there. Every house is still there. And they're finding it in the parks around the area. And, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers, and we will agree, because it's beta and alpha emitters, it is not for you to walk over the soil won't cause you any harm. But if you garden, if you ingest soil, if you, you know, if you're a kid playing on a playground and you're playing in the dirt, you're ingesting and inhaling, right? And so that is a concern, and they are finding it on the playgrounds. They are finding it around the area. You know, the Army Corps of Engineers, again, these engineers, they came in, they didn't understand how much the creek flooded. They didn't understand the change over time of this community until we sat down and explained it to them. And so all we can do is, you know, they're doing a hell of a job with the funding that they have is push for funding because they need to get this area cleaned up and they need to do it fast. Held to what Fuse Wrap, which is the formerly utilized site for the Manhattan Project, designates to them for funds. So the guys that are local to our area are doing what they can with what they're given. So from a big government perspective, we need additional funding. We can't cut this project. We are not the only site in America that is, you know, left behind for the Manhattan Project. They're all over the country. It, it's a problem. It's a it's a much bigger problem than people realize. How how are people are people notified when they buy these homes that hey by the way the the ground is got irradiated soil and that the no they're not go to the website again it's coldwatercreeksfacts.com coldwatercreekfacts.com 